Coming up on Judge Rinder's Crime Stories. We were still in the garden, just sat talking, and literally seconds later, I heard this bang. A family gathering goes badly wrong. Grandad shot me mummy, and he looked up at my granddad and he said, why would you shoot me granddad? The investigation is about finding the truth for all parties. I'd said, you know, right from early on, if this comes back and it was a direct shot, then this changes everything. And later... Moped crime in London was exploding. A violent gang causing chaos on the streets of the capital. Commercial burglaries. Robbing uniformed police officers. The robbery at Sand Pitts Lane. Just despicable. We weren't quite sure what they were going to do next, and the pressure really was on. These were individuals that really needed to be targeted. When Jenny Dees and Andy Metcalf met in 2008, Jenny already had two children from a previous relationship. But as time went by, the couple felt that a child together would complete their family. However, a tragedy was about to strike that would lead to a devastating loss and the irrevocable breakdown of a loving family. I've been with Andy for about 12 years now, and we decided to go for a round of RVF. We found out about seven weeks later I was pregnant and we went for a scan at Sheffield and they told us that was having twins. And we got Stanley and Elsie. Um, you know, two, two amazing, amazing little babies that, you know, um, just changed our lives really. They were, they were inseparable. Growing up, they was always together. Um, Stanley always followed Elsie. Uh, Elsie took the lead. She took Stanley everywhere and she was in charge. But he loved football, cricket, um, anything, ten anything, you anything to do with sport, he absolutely adored. He just became you know, my little shadow, he, he came to work with me. We, we went to football, we watched football. He was developing into a, a proper little character and I was the proudest parent in the world because he was my little boy. With the birth of the twins, the whole family were overjoyed. None more so than Jenny's grandparents, who lived in a small rural village just a few miles up the road. They just obviously adored them because I'm the first person to have twins in the family. So when Stanley and Elsie was born, my granddad was over the moon. Stanley was always looking forward to seeing my nanny and my granddad. He used to love going up to Sprotley. Uh, the village was so lovely. It was in lots of um, scenery, the church is nearby. Um, so yes, we did used to go up there quite often and Stanley did used to like meeting my granddad and doing things with him. The family had already planned their next visit to Stanley's great-granddad, Albert Grannon's house. But it was a nice surprise when they bumped into him the day before. I've taken him football training and, and Stan had said, Daddy, can we, can we stop off at the shop and will you get me a drink? As I walked in the shop, um, Albert and his wife Jenny were, were in the shop as well. So I was talking to them and they said, oh, you, you're taking Stanley football training. So I said, yeah, yeah, he's just out there in the car, just running to get him a drink. My granddad popped his head in the window, the car window, and said, hi, Sunshine, how are you doing? And then my granddad mentioned to Stanley that you're coming to see me tomorrow because it's Uncle Andrew's anniversary. And it was only when I got in the car, Stanley said, oh, Granddad, he's going to show me his gun when I go, when I go around. He's got a gun. So I said, all right, OK. And I didn't think any more, any more of it, to be honest. The next day, with Andy at work, Jenny took the twins to Albert's house, where the family were gathering to commemorate the 15th anniversary of the death of Albert's son. My nan and my granddad was in the garden when we arrived. 
and directly at the bottom of the garden is a, is a garage where my granddad was. And Stanley was shouting, Granddad, I'm here. And my granddad shouted from the garage, Oh, hi, sunshine, nice to see you. You know, it was both happy to see each other. It was a lovely sunny day, so we sat in the garden. And then Stanley said to me, Oh, Mummy, can I go see Granddad's gun? So I said, Oh, right, OK. I said, Yes, that's fine. So he said to my granddad, Can I go see your gun? So he said, Yeah, come on then. Off we went into the kitchen. We were still in the garden and I was just sat talking. And literally seconds later, I heard this horrendous loud bang. And I just instantly knew something wasn't right. Stanley was stood there and he had his hand over his tummy and I said to him, I said, son, what's the matter? So he said, Grandad shot me mummy. And he looked up at my granddad and he said, why would you shoot me granddad? And I looked up at my granddad and said, have you shot him granddad? And he just said, I don't know. I lifted Stanley's top up fully up by this point and I checked him over, but it was the opposite side and I noticed a really tiny pellet wound and he kept saying, Grandad shot me, Mummy, Grandad shot me. I screamed at my nana and I said, ring an ambulance. The ambulance came, um, two ladies turned up and took over. At that point, I felt relieved. I thought, they're here now, they're here now. They're going to take him straight to hospital and everything's going to be OK. Suddenly, at this point, didn't seem right. He kept drifting in and out not making sense of what he was trying to say to me. She scooped Stanley up in, his arm, in her arms and she said, we need to go now. When we was in the ambulance, they did some checks on Stanley and then all of a sudden she just said something to the lady in the front, we need to go now. Before the door shut, Elsie was stood at the door and she's saying to me, Mummy, what's happened to Stanley? She said, is he going to die? And I said, no, Elsie, Stanley won't die. I promise you, darling, he's going to be fine and everything will be OK. You stay with Nanny and I will ring you as soon as I can. On hearing the news, Stanley's father had rushed to the hospital to be with his wife and son. Me and Andy, was just walking up and down, praying that he was going to be OK. Um, this nurse kept coming out every couple of minutes, telling us what's going on, what's happening. Um, I kept saying, is he breathing? Is the heart going? Is the heart beating? And she said, unfortunately, no, Jenny, we can't get the heart to beat just right now. We're repairing the bowel. We need to repair the bowel, it's bleeding. The nurse kept coming back out and she said, we've got a heartbeat, Jenny. I remember thinking, I've got a chance. I've, we've got a chance of getting him back. Um, I just remember crying, just thinking and praying, please bring him bad boy back. She went back in, she came back out, and then I just knew by her face. She just said, she went, I'm so sorry. We've lost the heartbeat. Um, I just cried, just cried my eyes out. And then the doctor came out not long after and said, can, can I talk to you? And, and that's when you know he's, he's gone and all your dreams. <sighs> Stanley Metcalf passed away on the 26th of July, 2018, at only six years of age. Jenny had promised Elsie um, that Stanley would be OK. She came to the hospital with a family member holding a Get Well card for her twin brother. I've got a card for Stanley, Mummy. Can I give it to him? I said, you can, darling. I said, but we've got some very sad news. 
and I had to then tell Elsie that this person she'd spent six years of her life with, uh, who was a shadow, um, actually wasn't OK. And she said, what do you mean, what do you mean? And I said, Sadly's gone to heaven. And she just broke down. She said to me, you promised me, Mummy, before Stanley left, you promised me that Stanley was going to be OK. You lied to me. Due to the circumstances surrounding Stanley's death, an investigation began with immediate effect. The investigation is about finding the truth for all parties. So it's looking at what happened, how it happened, and ultimately why it happened, and then moving on from there. The initial thoughts were um, that the grandfather, Albert Grannon, was shown his grandson um, a weapon. The weapon had gone off and Stanley was injured. I first met Albert Grannon probably a few days after I'd met the family and I informed him that I would be interviewing him formally because of the circumstances and because Stanley had died. Albert Grant said the reason for having the weapon was that he shot vermin and squirrels with it. He didn't realise it was loaded. He hadn't used it for some time, about seven or eight weeks. He always exhausted it after every use into the air, and then he would store it generally in a side room in his house. Albert Grannon um, has an injury to his hand um, where he's lost four fingers in the past and had them stitched back on again. So his hand, um, he can't use it very well. So he described how he held the weapon, how he was holding it in his good hand against his body with his injured hand propping it. So um, he assumed that as the weapon was pointing down, It must have ricocheted off the floor and hit Stanley in the side. That's what he believed had happened, that he'd um, fired the gun and it had ricocheted off the floor and into Stanley. So obviously that is vital that we establish if that has happened. So to support the investigation, we sought the services of um, professional forensics who deal in firearms. They came down to the address and examined the address um, with our crime scene investigators to either prove or disprove if it was a ricochet. We sent the weapon off for testing. We needed the ballistic experts to corroborate what Mr. Grannon had said and test the theory whether the um, pellet had ricocheted off the floor or whether it was a direct hit. Coming up. They came to speak to us and said, we have to read what's being said. Stanley's parents discovered the truth behind the fatal incident. I was thinking to myself, oh my God. I'd said, if this comes back, uh, it was a direct shot, then this changes everything. Whilst Albert Grannon was showing his air rifle to his six-year-old great-grandson, Stanley Metcalf, a shot had been fired. The single pellet caused a wound to Stanley's abdomen, and he later died in hospital. Now, with the police carrying out a full investigation, would the forensic evidence match Albert's account of the incident? There were two things that, that, that came to mind. Could this have been an accidental discharge that ricocheted from the floor, or was it a direct shot? Brought in to examine the scene was senior firearms scientist Andre Horn. My 
objective at the scene was to, to look for evidence to either prove or disprove any of those um, uh, propositions. There were some marks on the floor which we looked at. I have a chemical testing kit with me to test impact marks. The pellet is made of lead, so we, we, we would test for lead. Um, we, we tested for lead. They all turned out to be negative. So we decided to, to test the air rifle and set up a, uh, a shooting experiment where we ricocheted pellets from ceramic tiles similar to the ones in the kitchen of, of, of um, Mr. Grannon's house. And during our experiments, we found that the, the, the pellets, e even if we varied the, the, the angle, the pellets shattered. The injury to Stanley's body was roughly about 60 centimeters off the ground. Those fragments, none of them actually rose higher than about two or three centimeters. We couldn't find anything to support a proposition that there was a, a ricochet. We were capable of, of um, concluding that the injury to Stanley was the result of a direct shot. Further analysis also revealed alterations had been made to the air rifle. We explained to him what the forensics had shown and the fact that his web weapon had been modified and had been more powerful and asked for his account on that. He explained that when he was first using it, he wasn't really hitting anything and he felt it needed to be more powerful. So before, when he was shooting at squirrels and rats, he wouldn't kill them. Now, it would kill them. If Mr. Grannon um, had been found in possession of this rifle and it had been tested prior to this incident, um, it, 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 he, he, would have, he would have been charged with a, a Section 1 firearms offence. Despite admitting that he'd had the weapon modified, Albert remained resolute that the injury to his great-grandson Stanley was the result of a ricochet. Perhaps the pathologist's report would convince him otherwise. From the injuries the pellet has caused traveling through his um, bowel, the pathologist is able to confirm that the pellet was traveling in a downward motion and then it has come in contact with his iliac artery in the base of his pelvis, which has caused the blood loss. So the pathologist is able to support that it wasn't a ricochet, it was a direct entry. He didn't really accept that that had happened. He said he couldn't believe that the pellet hadn't ricocheted off the floor. He couldn't believe um, that Stanley had lost his life and he was responsible. I tried to sort of make excuses for my granddad. Oh, it's an accident, it's an accident, it's, it's come off the floor, it's, not, it's bounced off a, a surface, it's not meant to hit him, it's, it's totally an accident. I'd said, you know, right from early on, if, if this comes back and uh, it was a direct shot, then this changes everything. They came to speak to us and said, we have to read what's being said. And on the reports, it's dated. It was pointed at him directly in a downward motion. It came from above. I believed he needed a prison sentence for what he'd done. There was two charges. There was the manslaughter and there was a Section 1 firearm. As the months passed with the investigation, Stanley's parents had been expecting an apology from Albert Grannon, but none was forthcoming. Jenny had said perhaps if Albert Grannon had come to see them, if he'd showed them some remorse, um, it might have been a different story. But as time went on, they wanted him to appear in court and they wanted him to be responsible for his actions and taken Stanley's life. 
However, on the 10th of June 2019, Albert pleaded guilty to both charges of manslaughter and to possession of a Section 1 firearm without a license. I actually saw my grandma for the first time at um, Hull Crown Court the day he entered his plea. I saw most of my family members that day and nobody came across to say, are you OK? All I have done is lost my son. They say it's an accident, it, which, you know, why should he be getting punished for an accident? For me, I feel like no matter who it was, if you've caused the death of somebody, you need to take responsibility for your actions. The day of sentencing, the family were able to read out the victim personal statements, which were very, very um, impactful. And at that point, I don't think there was a dry eye in the house from the press or anyone, and it was very, very quiet. For me and for Andy, that was the hardest thing we've ever had to do in a courtroom. It was to put your feelings down on a piece of paper. It doesn't seem enough. It doesn't seem long enough. It doesn't seem enough to get out and how you feel. They just wanted to make it clear to everyone that Stanley had been shot by his great-granddad. They wanted to let everyone know how they felt. I sat down, I looked over at my granddad, and I still couldn't see any kind of emotion from him. For a man who's just uh, shot his great-grandson and he's looking at a prison sentence, never actually once shed a tear, and that's hard to understand how, how, how cold you would have to be to not shed a tear. Throughout the investigation, Albert Grannon had given several contradictory accounts of the incident in question. I think because Albert has never said exactly what happened, the judge asked him um, to reflect and to like come back for the for Jenny and Andy to say exactly what happened on that day. The judge had said, this court doesn't actually know the truth, that your statements have changed three times. I want you to go out of this court. I want you to come back in and, and tell this family and this court what actually happened on that day. The judge sent Albert out, and I've never known that happen before. He then had to um, tell the judge exactly what he did that day. But his barrister did that for him. And his reasons were that he held his, the rifle in his left hand because his right hand wasn't functional. And he squeezed the trigger to check if it was loaded whilst pointing at Stanley, but not intentionally. I still can't get me around that. I still can't get my head round why you would point such a powerful weapon at a six-year-old child. You know, no matter how many times I hear this story and how many times I hear what happened, it still doesn't get any easier to accept and it's still unbelievable. He had an opportunity to say sorry, you know, and he didn't. Even family members could have said on his behalf, this is what Grandin wants to say to you. And how sorry he is, but I never received anything. On the 2nd of July, 2019, 78-year-old Albert Grannon was sentenced to three years in prison for the manslaughter of his six-year-old great-grandson, Stanley Metcalf. He also received a concurrent four-month sentence for possession of a Section 1 firearm without a license. Still no contact, still no sorries, still no messages, still no letters, email, anything, no contact whatsoever. It's definitely divided our family, without a doubt, yeah. There's certain family members that no longer talk no more. The main focus is Elsie, you know, her life's never going to be the same. She's lost, you know, she's lost a, a twin brother. Um, we just have to try and make sure uh, she, she has the best life 
we can give her. Since the tragedy, Jenny and Andy are using their experience to call for a significant change in the law. Sally's law is about changing the licensing laws around air weapons. At the moment, in Scotland and Ireland, they have a law in place for all air weapons to have a certificate or a license. At the minute, England doesn't have that. So my aim for Stanley's Law now is to have that license put in place and to bring in education and training surrounding air weapons. That's what it's for. I've also gone out to parades, fairs, um, I've gone out with my petitions and talked to people. I've spoke to thousands of people now, trying to educate them on the laws around air rifles. And 90% of them people I talk to don't know anything about rifles, don't know anything about the laws or training or education. So that's my main aim now, is to get out there and speak to as many people as I possibly can and educate them. This case provides a stark reminder about the dangers of all air rifles, whatever their size and power. But Jenny hopes that her campaigning about Stanley's law will mean that in the future, the loss of other precious lives can be prevented and some good may come out of this appalling tragedy. Coming up. The Metropolitan Police take on a violent moped gang terrorizing the capital. Commercial burglaries. Robbing uniformed police officers. The robbery at Sam Pitts Lane. Just despicable. The pressure really was on to crack down on these people, identify them, and effect arrests. Between the summer of 2017 and 2018, a violent moped gang undertook a string of brazen raids and robberies across the streets of London. With their identities concealed by helmets and dark clothing, and their capacity to speed away from their crimes on motorbikes, the Met Police were faced with a difficult challenge. How could they stop the gang in their tracks? This is the case of Operation Fieldhouse. Moped crime in London was exploding. They could move around the city of London very, very easily, very quickly. They could get onto pavements. They'd identify the more vulnerable individuals, generally on their phone. They would then target those particular individuals for the higher value uh, mobile phones, and it would take seconds. There was a lot of coverage in the media. A lot of people were filming incidents and putting it out on social media and that was increasing the fear. It was a really prolific growth crime that was putting a lot of, uh, of people in fear, just going about their day-to-day -day business and walking around London. The police were unable to pursue um, offenders if they were on a moped. Across the capital, Moped crime groups were forming at an unprecedented rate. But amongst the chaos, the activities of the gangs were becoming more serious, more professional, and increasingly more violent. Some of these moped uh, gangs were be becoming a, a number one priority because not only were they doing the sort of snatch offences, but they were also going around armed with uh, knives. The reason why we started Operation Fieldhouse was as a result of an incident in November um, of 2017. Some uniform officers were sat up with a stolen moped that had just been recovered, uh, an individual had been arrested, and whilst they were sat up on it waiting for a recovery truck to come and collect the moped, they were attacked with powder extinguishers. And during that distraction, recovered that stolen moped. Now that was a very, very audacious offense robbing uniformed police officers 
in the middle of a street in London and that highlighted to me immediately that these were individuals that really needed to be targeted. They were clearly very violent, got no uh, respect for the law. These are the people that we needed to, uh, to prioritise and focus on. They were committing crimes um, quite regularly and similar types of crime. So we realised they were quite prolific, but we sort of had to work backwards with them. They were sort of one step ahead of us. They knew police methods. They didn't leave forensics at crime scenes. Um, they knew about our capabilities there. So they were wearing motorcycle helmets, which covered their identity, um, generic sort of clothing, tracksuit bottoms, dark clothing, to conceal their identity. They knew about vehicle identification. They, they would do anything so that it was hard for anybody to say, well, that was, that was you, um, because they knew about um, AMPR, automatic number plate recognition. There was a lot of bikes that they were swapping over, stealing bikes, committing their crimes, then changing bikes. They were also changing um, number plates. They'd used um, black tape to slightly alter the number plate to frustrate anyone that was following. So commit the crime, someone takes down a registration number of that, get around the corner, take the bit of tape off, and then there's a completely different number plate that's on there. Police scoured through hours of surveillance footage, but were unable to identify the perpetrators. However, it wasn't long before the gang struck again, this time attacking a business in Kensington High Street in the city centre. This organised crime group targeted a particular high-value uh, clothing shop. Now, they utilised a stolen uh, Range Rover, a big vehicle that had been stolen by way of burglary. And they rammed, rammed it in order to effect entry, and then the rest of the gang came on mopeds. Once they're able to effect entry into the shop... They've just grabbed as much of the, the high-value um, uh, clothing as they, as they could, and they've taken it out onto mopeds. We're talking about jackets that are worth hundreds and hundreds of pounds. So in a few minutes, uh, a few minutes' work for them, they've, they've made several thousands of pounds. But unsatisfied with the amount of high-value loot they were able to lay their hands upon, the gang paid the store a further visit a month later. They actually returned to that same venue a number of weeks later. And by then, the, the store has tried to increase their security. They returned again, this time armed with planks of wood. To assault the security guard. The security guard did try and do his job and defend the shop. However, he was overpowered and he was assaulted. Once the security guard had left the premises for his own safety, they then again ransacked. They didn't leave any physical evidence. They left no forensics. Um, so we've still got these individuals who are committing varying um, theft offences. Um, we weren't quite sure what they were going to do next, but what we did know was that they were getting increasingly um, confident and they were growing in their um, crime spree. The gang's raids on the clothing store cost £80,000 in damage, with missing stock worth £43,000. Then, in March 2018, during preparations for the Oxford-Cambridge boat race on Lonsdale Bridge in London, the gang were responsible for the theft of a BBC camera worth up to £180,000. The robbers had now become so brazen, they were happy to carry out their audacious offences in full public view. But nothing would prepare the police, or indeed the nation, for their next criminal act. So the crime probably that um, resonates most within this investigation and is just despicable was the robbery at Sam Pitts Lane. On the 21st of June 2018 in Richmond, a mother was returning home from nursery with her three-year-old daughter. And I saw this female walking with a young child. They laid in wait for her to get to a particular point where they could ambush her. 
as she crossed um, Sam Pitts Road, she, she was approached by two males. And one of the males said, you know, give me your rings or I will hurt your child. And in doing that, he grabbed her arm um, and then lurched forward to try and grab the child. They've gone straight for the child and you can see straight away that the, the female is in fear for her life and her, and her child's life. Through sheer fear that somebody was going to harm her child and herself, this lady ran out into the busy road. To step backwards into busy traffic um, really demonstrates the, 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 the level of fear that she must have been under at that point in time. Despite their intimidating appearance, the occupants of a passing lorry were prepared to confront the gang. But they were too late, and the criminals were once again able to effect a getaway. The footage of the attempted robbery made front page news and caused outrage amongst the public, who were demanding for the men to be caught and brought to justice. The robbery did go you know, viral, and the pressure really was on us as the investigation team to crack down on these people, identify them, and effect arrests. Coming up, the net closes in on the gang. At that point in time, the decision was made that they needed to be arrested and detained before they could put anybody else in danger, and that instigated a pursuit. The Metropolitan Police had been tracking a notorious moped gang in the capital for months. But after a shocking attack on a mother and a toddler in broad daylight, the pressure was mounting to bring the masked criminals to justice. Operation Fieldhouse was about to step up a gear. At this point, we had um, commercial burglaries. We had uh, a motorbike taken from a street. They really did not care. They, they did not care about the, the fear that they, they were causing any individuals. They were just in it for themselves. What can we get out of here? We weren't quite sure what they were going to do next, and the pressure really was on us to effect arrests. But having left no forensic evidence at the scenes of their crimes, so far, the moped gang had been able to avoid identification. Now, this group was heavily into motorbikes and mopeds. That was their chosen mode of transport. They were quite fanatical about bikes. They all ride them, and they seem to be quite passionate about them. But a few months earlier, in January 2018, four members of the gang had targeted a residential home in Redditch, Worcestershire, over 100 miles north of the capital. They effected entry via the rear of this house. They stole um, the logbook and keys, which were situated downstairs in the house, and then they broke into the um, garage where there was two motorbikes. Um, police in the local area had been alerted, and then they, they'd sort of seen some suspicious activity in a, ve in a hire vehicle, and they'd stopped this vehicle. The police discovered that the four men had all travelled from London were equipped for burglary and also in possession of motorbike helmets. These defendants were then arrested um, by West Midlands Police and they conducted their own investigation, um, but unfortunately they didn't get um, to the charge point. Terry Marsh, Ryan Moran, Stephen Weller and Aaron Pask were already known to the Metropolitan Police Service, who now consider them to be potential suspects and place them immediately under surveillance. We'd carry out observations at um, addresses or locations. Uh, we'd see the, um, the, the suspects coming and going. So we used um, conventional surveillance methods. We used um, an abundance of CCTV, which assisted us in um, identifying locations and trying to identify associates. We'd obviously know when offences had occurred, we could then go back to look at the observations, look at what was seen, what they were wearing, how they were travelling, etc. And then that built up a picture. And so we were able to evidence them before and after they put their masks on. We were able to identify them 
through distinguishing marks on their clothing that they weren't taking off after they got off of uh, the mopeds. When synchronised with police observations, the CCTV footage seemed to prove to investigators they were watching the right men. And upon even closer inspection, two members were emerging as primary leaders of the organised crime group. We identified Terry Marsh as the ringleader alongside um, Stephen Weller. They worked very closely together as heading this group. Police may have wanted to arrest their two key suspects, but they still hadn't yet collected enough evidence to be able to charge the others for their crimes. If we were to take action before that point, then it has the negatives of alerting them to um, the police attention. Um, they can change their methodologies, they could change their uh, locations. So we had to make um, intelligence-led decisions in relation to when we would target particular individuals. With communication integral to the criminal success, detectives now ran forensic searches of mobile phone data in the hope it would unmask the rest of the gang. A lot of phones were, were used by them. They were swapping them quite regularly and it was painstaking for the phone's officer um, to piece together um, who was contacting who and then um, the where lo locating where the phone was at the time of the offences and then attributing that phone to the suspect. The meticulous work by police began to pay dividends and one by one, more associates were coming on to the police's radar. We were able to identify them from their mobile phones that they were using before, during and after their offences. So although their face was covered during the offences, their mopeds or motorbikes were disguised by having false number plates on them, actually, it didn't make a difference. We knew we had to stop them, which is when we moved into the arrest phase and we were confident we knew who and what we were looking for. But on the 7th of May, 2018, just as detectives were closing in on the gang, they witness one of their most violent crimes to date. They were using a, a, a very large uh, zombie-type knife uh, to try and commit a, a robbery on another individual to steal another uh, motorbike. At that point in time, the decision was made that they needed to be arrested and detained at that point before they could put anybody else in danger, and that instigated a pursuit. Three suspects on two mopeds through this pursuit, and uh, they paid no regard at all to other road users or pedestrians. Uh, at many occasions, they um, almost had uh, collisions uh, with um, individuals that were crossing the roads or with other, other vehicles that had to swerve um, to avoid them driving at speed. But further on in that pursuit, as they went around a hard corner, um, one of the mopeds slipped on its side and the rider fell off. And that rider then also got onto the one remaining moped. So for the end of the pursuit, we had all three suspects on the one moped. And it continued for a, a while longer until trained police drivers were able to safely use tactical contact on those offenders. One of the criminals led police on a foot chase through the local cemetery, but it wasn't long before he was also apprehended. Following the arrests of the three men, 22-year-old Omar Tafat, 20-year-old Kian Taylor, and 19-year-old Josh Myers, nine further suspects were targeted by detectives. So we arrested the important ones, the key players, and then the other, the other ones came as and when as the investigation unfolded but it was warrants that were executed and then items of um, clothing were found which were identifiable on the CCTV. Bikes were then also recovered, which we were able to say was used in the robbery um, and other offences. In the following weeks, the Met Police were able to round up all the remaining members of the gang. Initially, most of the offenders were um, deciding to go not guilty, wanted to challenge the evidence. But um, when they saw uh, 
the, when they saw the level of evidence, the vast majority of the individuals went guilty for almost all of the offences. We did have overwhelming evidence. You know, this is an investigation that officers had put months and months of work in. Um, so we worked really, really hard as a team to combat this gang um, and infiltrate them to a, a good conclusion. So the evidence we presented was overwhelming. The 12 gang members were sentenced to a total of 67 years and 10 months imprisonment for offences including conspiracy to rob, conspiracy to burgle, conspiracy to steal, criminal damage, and handling stolen goods. For his part in organising the group, Terry Marsh received the most severe term of 13 years and two months. Getting the larger sentence for, for Terry Marsh who was very systematic, uh, very integral to the workings of, of, of this gang, it was very satisfying. So this gives a message to similar moped gangs that the police will not tolerate this type of crime. We will, we will track you down, we will 